on medulloblastoma bench to bedside in the Asian context. And these are my disclosures. And what I'd like to do in the next half an hour is present the scope of the problems, go over the four groups of uh, uh, medullo, WIMP, Sonic Hedgehog Group 3 and Group 4, and then end up with a glimpse to the future. So medulloblastoma is an increasing complex disease with the classification evolving as we improve our genomic technologies. New data is being generated at a very fast pace and the clinical translational is very difficult to implement as there's very little prospective published clinical outcome data based on molecular classification. The clinical trials that we plan from opening the studies to patient accrual to the data analysis is the 10-year life cycle. And the patients and families, as we well know, are impatient to get biologically informed therapy. So what I'd like to do is present our work, which was just published in JCO, um, which really goes over the outcome of our SGMBOC trial, which is a large international prospective multicenter uh, trial. And the schema of the treatment was as follows. After maximal safe surgical resection, um, patients were classified as average risk or high risk, and high average risk were predominantly patients with no metastatic disease and minimal residual tumor. High risk patients were predominantly patients which had metastatic disease with only a few patients which had residual tumor. The average risk patients got 23.4 gray craniospinal radiation therapy with a total dose to the primary site of 55.8 gray. The high risk patients got 36 to 39.6 gray craniospinal radiation therapy, again, with a primary boost to the tumor bed to 55.8 to 59.4 gray. And the metastatic sites, uh, which had bulky disease, got additional radiation therapy boost. And following uh, completion of radiation therapy, patients had a six week uh, break. And then they got four cycles of chemotherapy, which consisted of wincristine, cyclophosphamide, and cisplatin. And in this particular protocol, uh, we gave them stem cell rescue. Uh, to help the counts recover on time to maintain the dose intensity. Mind you, the regimen itself is not a myeloablative uh, regimen. I think another key point I'd like to make is we did not give interesting during uh, radiation therapy, and we saw minimal um, neurological complications and neuropathies in our patient cohort. So among the 330 patients which were enrolled on the study, this is the progression-free and overall survival. And at five years, you can see you can cure roughly uh, about uh, slightly less than 80% of the patients uh, diagnosed with medulloblastoma with current therapy. If you looked at the traditional uh, features, uh, which are considered uh, risk features clinically, you can see that the average risk patients are sitting at about 85% and the high risk patients we can cure roughly about 60% at five years. And this risk was predominantly, as I mentioned, um, based on metastatic disease. And again, we have 227 standard risk patients and 103 high risk patients. If you look at histology, patients which had nodular uh, desmoplastic or classic histology did much better compared to patients which had anaplastic or large cell histology. Again, anaplastic large cell histology was 52 patients out of the 330 patients. And I think this is a very important slide because this is something that we can impact today with our therapy. Patients which had no residual disease after surgery, which was majority of the patients, 315 patients, the outcome is again sitting at about 80% with patients which had residual disease, a small percentage of patients, 14% inferior uh, uh, progression free survival. So while it is important to get gross total resection, I think there's a balance between surgical skill and hurting the patient uh, in trying to get a gross total resection. So what we did in keeping with the current genomic um, sort of classification was we took the average risk and high risk patients and then did methylation profiling on all of them and then split. 
So among the average risk group of patients, which were 206, uh, we had 46 WIT, 40 sonic hedgehog, 33 group three patients, and 87 group four patients. Whereas in the 99 higher risk patients, which had methylation profiling, you can see how the numbers switch. We had only seven WIT patients, eight sonic hedgehog, we had 32 uh, group three patients, and the remaining uh, patients which were made up of group four. So you can see the group four and group three dominate uh, the high risk presentations. And again, if you look at the progression-free survival by the uh, subgrouping, you can see that the average risk patients, you can see the winds do very well compared to the group four, the sonic hedgehog, and the group three patients. But compared to which I hear all the time when I get always a group three medulla, he's going to do poorly. Just by clinical risk features, group three patients, which do not have metastatic disease and do not have any other clinical high risk feature, we can cure roughly about 70% of these patients, which is not bad. Now you compare this to the progression free survival in high risk group. Again, you see that the WIPs do well. Your know, group four patients, you can cure roughly uh, about 70%. You can compare this to roughly about 90%. The group threes drop to about 40%. And then the high risk um, sonic hedgehogs do very poorly. And this is again, predominantly based on metastatic disease. So translating all this information by the subgroups, let's talk about the WIT uh, subgroup patients first. And these patients uh, consist of children and young adults. You don't see WIT subgroup in the infants. I think just a brief uh, sort of overview, the majority mutation uh, in these patients is the beta catenin mutation, which again, you can see exclusively uh, is group of patients which have APC gene mutation, and I'll talk about this later, 4% do not have beta catenin mutations. You can see P53 mutations which are present, uh, and this, again, we'll talk about a little bit, does not impact the event-free survival, and then you can see a smattering of other mutations uh, which are present. And the big telltale molecular uh, cytogenetic feature is a monosomy 6, and you can see this well demonstrated over here. Now, we talked about getting a gross total resection for these patients. There is this situation on some group, uh, WIT group patients, where the surgeon uh, um, will tell you, listen, there was a lot of bleeding, and I really couldn't get all this tumor out, and here is such a patient. This girl was a basketball player, and I got a call from the operating room, um, and our surgeon said, listen, I can't get this tumor out. There's a lot of bleeding. Um, and if I take it all out, I'll hurt her such that she'll never be able to walk. So we said, let it go. In my mind, I knew uh, that this would probably be a wind tumor. And you can see uh, this axial uh, flare imaging with contrast. You can see the score of tumor, and you can see it restricts very nicely. So this is a subgroup of patients. You can give chemotherapy, and the tumor almost melts away. And this is the post-op where you can see on a post-chemo where you can see with contrast um, on a flare imaging that all the tumor is gone. In fact, the radiologist said, wow, they got a gross total resection. Well, this was a chemotherapy-induced gross total resection. And you can see the areas of restriction have also gone. So if you, again, compare the five-year survival for average risk and high risk, a wind medulla, you said 46 patients which had average risk disease, 100% uh, um, event-free survival, and high-risk patients, uh, again, 100% uh, uh, event-free survival. So this is a subgroup of patients which do very well. I, again, want to sort of highlight this. You've got to think about germline transmission. And as I mentioned, we have the germline APC mutation, which is distinct group of patients, then the beta catenin mutation, and you can see this uh, in a small number of patients. And again, you can see the monosomy 6, which is distributed among the patients which have APC mutation and the beta catenin mutation. And the patients with germline APC are predisposed to get colon cancer, and they need to be monitored carefully after completing therapy. So in summary, with the WIT molecular group, the female predominant, the older patients, classic histology by fish, 
We can see monosomy 6, immunohistochemistry is the nuclear beta catenin, um, excellent outcome for patients which have metastatic disease. Again, family history important for detecting germline APC mutations, and a long term uh, follow up is important for subsequent malignancies. So, in, in the Asian context, uh, what is important? We do not need any fancy technology to diagnose these patients. They are usually midline tumors. You have a 10 to 15 percent of the patients can uh, can be sort of not hemispheric, but sitting at the CP angle, like I showed you. Fish is widely available. Immunohistochemistry is widely available. The staging is done by MRI uh, and CSF cytology, and you're good to go uh, with these patients. The surgeon will often tell you that the bleeding was unusual. So, what is happening right now for these with uh, medulloblastomas across the world? There are three studies which are currently ongoing. There's the PMET5 study for patients older than 16 years of age. They get 23.4 gray CSI with a primary site boost. The patients less than 16 get 18 gray CSI with a primary site boost and six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. The COG study gives 18 gray CSI uh, along with a primary site boost to uh, 54 gray and seven cycles of chemotherapy with cisplatinum, uh, CCNU, and Christine, and cyclone with Christine. And our St. Jude International Study, which gives 15 gray CSI with a primary site boost and only four cycles of chemotherapy with cisplatinum, cyclone, and Christine. All these studies are accruing very well. Um, the PNET study may be very close to uh, finishing accrual, and so is ours. And the COG study is not far behind. And I think the results of these studies will really guide uh, the therapy for these wind medulloblastomas. I anticipate that you'll be hearing about these uh, studies in the next year, year and a half. The key point I do want to make is that there are very strict eligibility criteria for each protocol for entry. Um, these patients are selected on the basis of immunohistochemistry for beta catenin being nuclear and fish by monosomy 6 or by the beta catenin gene mutation. Uh, they are very carefully selected uh, for metastatic disease and the amount of residual disease. So you want to really have no residual disease and no metastatic disease before you start cutting back on the dose of radiation therapy. Moving to the sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma, these patients are present in infants, children, and adults. Um, and this is a very molecularly heterogeneous uh, disease. And I think one has to understand this. So the majority of the patient in infants is sonic hedgehog. Similarly, majority of the medulloblastoma in uh, adults is sonic hedgehog. And in children, we see sonic hedgehog disease, which is roughly 20% uh, of the total uh, number of uh, medulloblastomas that you see in this age group. I will not be talking about the um, infant uh, sonic hedgehog medulla. That's a topic in itself. I'll allude to it uh, briefly, but I will not be talking about it. So, classic location for uh, sonic hedgehog medulla is hemispheric. This is just a consult uh, we got uh, last week. Um, and they were saying, you know, we were, we've sent the tumor out for subtyping by methylation. Well, in this particular location, um, you see the picture and you know this is a sonic hedgehog medulla until proven otherwise. And it did turn out to be a sonic hedgehog medulla with uh, unfortunately very aggressive uh, uh, biological features, which included anaplastic histology, MCAN amplification, and uh, P53 mutation. Again, the classic genetic alterations are patched uh, P53, uh, and this ELP, which is a germline mutation, and then you have a, a MCAN amplification, which is seen in these patients. Now, in sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma, compared to with medulloblastoma, P53 mutations uh, really import a very negative prognosis. Cytogenetically, uh, we see loss of uh, 9Q and, again, uh, 17 uh, P and 17, occasionally 17Q deletion. Now, if you look at the progression for survival by risk, and again, I showed this to you, uh, in the previous slide, we have 40 patients which have an average risk disease, and you can see at about five years we're curing 80% compared to um, 
25% of the patients with high risk disease. So this uh, subgroup, just the metastatic disease, denotes a very poor prognosis. Now, if you do risk modeling for the sonic hedgehog medullose, like I mentioned, this is again patients which had no metastatic disease uh, to try to find out which of the 20% of those standard uh, risk patients which are failing. You see anaplastic uh, histology, important P53 mutations, important MCAN amplification, GLE amplification, and chromosome uh, 17P loss. And you can see that a lot of these features overlap with each other. So like the case I showed you um, in the previous uh, slide with the MRIs, had a large cell anaplastic uh, histology and P53 mutation, a MCAN amplification. So you can see that this patient will have a very, very poor prognosis. And now if you stratify based on the molecular risk and the clinical risk, you can see that in the new low risk stratification, you can cure 100% of these patients and cure about 40% of the patients which have a uh, high risk disease by clinical and molecular risk. So in future, this will be the group of patients that we could slowly start adjusting the therapy. So the high risk features, again, I want to go over with you, metastatic disease, anaplastic large cell histology, P53 loss, um, make N amplification, GLE amplification, or a chromosome 17P deletion. Again, don't need super duper technology to make these uh, risk classifications. Uh, histology uh, is routinely done. P53 can be done by immunohistochemistry. MCAN can be done uh, by uh, FISH. Uh, chromosome 17P deletion uh, also can be done by uh, FISH. So, Again, using simple technologies which are widely available, uh, you can get a risk stratification for these patients. Now, germline transmission for this group is very important. You can see a BRCA mutation patch, SUFU, P53 mutation, which is present. Uh, there is this newer information of patients which have L1 uh, mutations, which are germline. You can see they're distinct from the SUFO mutations in the P53 mutation. And you can see they're present the most common germline uh, mutation, which is present in sonic hedgehog, accounting for 14.4% of the patients. Uh, uh, so in 29 out of the 202 patients. And you can see that compared to what one would predict, uh, the ELF1 mutant P53 wild type have an excellent uh, the survival, the ELP1 wild type and 53 wild type have an excellent survival. The ELP1 wild type and 53 mutant uh, do poorly. So this is being driven by 53 mutation and uh, the ELP1 mutation does not impact survival. But again, they are mutually exclusive. So if you have a P53 mutation, you're not going to have an ELP1. If you have a ELP1 uh, mutation, you are not going to have a P53 mutation. So treatment. So for the standard risk disease currently, um, which are M0, either gross totally resected or neotropically resected, classic plastic histology, uh, patients are getting 23.4 grade CSI, primary site RT boost and adjuvant chemotherapy. We do four cycles of chemo, again, simple cisplatinum, uh, vincristine and cyclo. We do not give vincristine during radiation. Yeah, it hurts these patients. And as I showed you, we are curing 100% of these patients. This is a group of patients in prospective studies that we could potentially cut back the craniospinal dose. For the high risk patients with metastatic disease, anaplastic histology, MCAN or glee amplification, chromotripsis, patients are getting 36 to 39.6 gray, a primary site boost and adjuvant chemotherapy. Again, we give uh, four cycles of chemotherapy, no with Christian during radiation, and we are curing um, roughly 45% of these patients. The very high risk disease, the moment you throw P53 mutations in the somatic or germline, the outcome is very poor. There's no real consensus on um, how this to treat these patients, though most of them do get radiation and chemotherapy. And we're looking and studying this group very closely to get some hints as to uh, which of the patients among this group may be cured and which patients we need novel therapy. So this is a nice summary uh, of 
how we think about the different subgroups in sonic hedgehog medullo. You have the beta and the gamma, which are infant subgroups. The alpha, which is uh, the group which is predominantly in the pediatric population. Um, and then you have the delta, which is predominantly in adult disease. You can see uh, the different histologies and you can see the driver events for all of these different subgroups that vary. And I think that the purpose of this slide is really to show you that the P53 pathway mutations are only present predominantly in the group of patients that we see in the children. Um, out of 86 patients, P53 pathway mutations were present in about 55% of the patients. You see a very small percentage in, in adults, about 10%. And then this is the group of patients which, as I said again and again, do poorly. And uh, I think, again, when you, when you see this on an immun immunohistochemistry, and you, you can counsel the parents accordingly. And whether you give high-dose chemo, tandem high-dose chemo, you know, bathe them in Tiltipa, these are not curable patients. And I think one has to just recognize it's the biology of the disease uh, which is uh, driving this dismal outcome. So now switching to group three and group four, and the group three are predominantly present in infants and in children, and the group four uh, medullos are present again in infant children and in adults. And if you do a methylation uh, clustering, uh, as we did in our 305 patients, you can see that this group three, group four cohort is the largest cohort of a medulloblastoma, but there is some overlap. It's not clean cut, as you can see in the wind and the sonic hedgehog, uh, though majority of the patients cluster, but you can see areas where they overlap with each other. And we can talk about this in a little bit more detail. So again, in the group three, group four, uh, you have distinct genetic alterations. Uh, the MIXI amplification and the OTX2 amplification are the key drivers for the negative outcome for the group three patients. And then in the group four patients, you see MIXN and OTX2, which are the amplification, which are the, the, the drivers uh, for the outcome for these patients. Again, genetic changes, group three, you have chromosome eight abnormalities, chromosome 17 abnormalities, and in group four, you see chromosome seven, uh, chromosome eight, and then the 17P uh, um, isochromosome 17Q uh, with a uh, deletion of 17P, which is a main driver event. Now, if you just, again, stratify by risk, clinical risk, you can see, like I showed you before, that we can cure 70% of the group three uh, medulloblastomas, and the patients which have metastatic disease do poorly, we can, but even then we are curing roughly about 40% of the patients. With the group four, the patients which are average risk, we can cure upwards of 90%, and this is a good cohort of 87 patients, and the patients which have metastatic disease, we cure 70%, so not bad. Um, you know, you're still sitting about 70% for the group four subgroup. Now, if you do the similar risk modeling for the group three um, medullos, you can see the ones which are driving um, the negative prognosis of the metastatic disease and the scenic. Those are the two which are very important. And if you separate them out by metastatic status, again, you can see the numbers which I showed you in the previous slide. And then again, mixing amplification um, patients, roughly about 30% um, uh, progression-free survival at five years. And it's a small number of patients, only 10 patients we could see mixing amplification. Again, risk modeling for the group four medullos, the one which really drives the outcome is the metastatic disease. And again, you can see the data separated by the M0 and M plus, and I showed you again, 70% of the M plus can be cured, and we can cure upwards of 90% of the patients with M0 disease. Now, again, this is not something that needs to be done, uh, you know, but I'm just showing you where the field is going. We are now taking group three and group four medulloblastomas and dividing them into subgroups. There are eight, uh, subgroups of group three and group four medullo. This is on our cohort of 204 patients. And again, this is a bird's eye view of the gene um, amplifications or mutations which are seen. And you can see relatively, uh, they're mutually exclusive. 
uh, based on what the different uh, subtypes are. And this is a nice summary picture, uh, which is going to be uh, published in the new WHO guidelines, where you can see the group three and group four splitting into eight subgroups. And there's a clear distinct overlap between the group three and group four. So on, on um, the left-hand side of your sleeve, uh, the slide, you can see more group three patients exclusively, and then group as you go to group six, seven, and eight, exclusively uh, group four, you can see the group three patients do the worst with a 45% event-free survival, and you can see the molecular explanation, the MXC and MCAN amplified, whereas subgroup seven, which have very, very good prognosis, upwards of 85 to 90%, and do not have any of the bad mutations which are present. So again, this is something that you will start seeing percolating, but in your current practice, again, uh, the, you don't need to worry about this. And again, if you do risk factors for the combined uh, group three and group four patients with non-metastatic disease, you see anaplastic histology, mixy amplification, um, and group three subtype or the three ones, uh, three which do poorly. And then you can come up with a nice combined risk stratification of a 39 patients, which are new low risk, you can, you can see again at five years, roughly 95% of these patients can get cured. You have high risk patients, which about 60% can be cured. And then you have an intermediate subgroup, which can cure roughly about 85% of these patients. So in future protocols, various pins of this kind of risk stratification will be tested prospectively, and again, this data will be coming out over the next five to six years. Um, the Europeans have got their own risk modeling, and we are doing our own risk modeling um, uh, to molecularly separate these groups out. But again, you don't need super fancy technology, just with histology, metastatic disease, uh, which is done by MRI and CSF cytology, and then basically doing fish, you almost 90% or 95% are going to get your risk stratification. Germline transmission for group three and group four, you've got to think about PALB2 and BRCA2 mutations. BRCA mutations are again important for subsequent uh, malignancies. So again, if you want to start risk stratifying for the favorable risk group, you could go with 18 gray CSI, and adjust the duration of adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, those of you who we consult, I really don't think these patients need to be subjected to one year of chemotherapy with devastating uh, marrow suppression and excessive bl blood transfusion. I think we have been using four, four rounds of chemo and these patients do very well. Uh, again, I showed you in our risk stratification, 95% of these patients can be cured with 23.4 gray. Uh, 18 gray is something that needs to be tested for the standard risk of 23.4 gray um, CSI with the primary site boost. For the high risk patients, you can increase the dose of uh, craniospinal radiation therapy. Uh, one little nugget over here the, in the COG study, which randomized between carboplatin and no carboplatin during radiation therapy, uh, there is early data to show that the Carboplatin did help the metastatic disease only patients uh, in, in a subgroup three. This is something which was an ad hoc retrospective analysis, wasn't planned, will need to be proven in prospective trials with a proper statistical design. But this is some nugget of information uh, that you could potentially plug in for your group three M plus patients. And for the very high risk group, uh, Again, there, there, there's some preclinical data adding novel targeted therapy during uh, radiation therapy, and then again, adding novel chemotherapy following craniospinal radiation therapy. So in summary, uh, for medulloblastoma, it's a dynamic area of basic translational and clinical research. There's been amazing progress in the last decade. Uh, just to sort of put it in context, the first papers uh, which demonstrated some groups was published in uh, 2006 in JCO. I think this is the key point I want to make. Do not get enamored by whole genome and whole exome sequencing and methylation. You can get your risk stratification 
by MR imaging, CSF cytology, immunohistochemistry, and fish, you will almost get 95% of what you want to be for your patients. You may miss a little bit here and there, but your main classification you can get by technologies which are widely available uh, and nothing to do with fancy genomic uh, effort. Now, if it's available, go for it, but don't feel that you need to have it to start treating these patients in the modern era. There are large prospective clinical studies uh, which are uh, in progress and getting planned which will test the current hypothesis and the lay the groundwork for the next generation of studies. Um, we are planning our next protocol, and I know that we're working with the Europeans um, and the COG to plan the next generation of studies. And the genomic characteristics of these tumors will refine treatment uh, to improve cure rates. But I think the most important thing is we want to cure them, but want, do not want to give them the burden of long-term neurocognitive deficits. And I think that's a major driver for the ones which we can cure with current therapy. Can we very carefully reduce the, the uh, therapy so as to avoid the long-term uh, morbidities in these patients? So with this, I'd like to thank um, all our partners who take who work with us and uh, generate all this amazing data. And we do our genomic profiling. Um, the are all the participating institutions in our clinical studies. And again, want to thank the organizers from SIOP uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you.